Hello, hello everyone, good evening. I hope you can hear me okay. Well, thank you very much for the great honor of being invited to speak this evening. And what an incredible set of sessions we've already had uh, this afternoon. It was so interesting to hear uh, your investigative journalists talking about uncovering this great um, phone tapping scandal. And I, I really enjoyed hearing from uh, Mark, Mark Inedas, what an extraordinary guy he is. And if you didn't see his session, earlier this afternoon, please have a look at it again on YouTube. So I'm going to spend some of our time today uh, talking about new social media platforms, particularly TikTok. So let's have a quick show of hands. Who is on TikTok in this room? Come on, be honest. Okay, yeah. And of those, who would say, who uses TikTok every single day? Okay, this is really interesting. I'm seeing a bit of a generational split here. So uh, we'll, we'll revisit that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about TikTok and also about how uh, digital newsrooms are struggling to build trust with audiences. But before I do that, I want to spend a minute or two talking about what's happening uh, right now in Iran. This is a huge moment for the country, for human rights, for women's rights, and for press freedom. In 2017, I was lucky enough to go to Iran for the first and hopefully not for the last time. And what I saw then gave me hope, hope that in time, the young Iranians I saw would be able to shape the country in their own image, and hope because policymakers and officials I spoke to were, of course, a lot more conciliatory in private than they are in public. But of course, reporting the story of Iran is still such a huge challenge the suppression of the internet and the lack of agency news gathering in the country has posed questions for our newsrooms about how we all report the story. I believe we're still not doing a good enough job. It was vexing last week to see the Iran story struggle to get on air at all, particularly for US international broadcasters. And I was working with my fiance, who's an American Iranian, to try and raise the profile of the story and it had been eclipsed by coverage, rolling coverage of Hurricane Ian. Now, sometimes it feels like newsrooms struggle to walk and chew gum at the same time, that we're at our best when we're only really following one big story. And to be fair, the hurricane was an important story. It was consequential, and the pictures were compelling. But newsrooms have to be able to show their audiences that they can tell what's important in the world and that they can stop one story from dominating over all others. And if they don't, that can damage trust. It's a theme I want to return to a little later on. But for the moment, I wanted to say that I'm thinking of all Iranian journalists today and citizens of Iran who are trying to bring out the news of what's happening in the country right now. And when we can get hold of their content, we owe it to them to give it the highest profile we can. Press freedom is a central issue for Iran's future. The Iranian government has continued to harass BBC Persian journalists and from other international broadcasters too, working outside the country. In fact, my former colleagues at BBC Persian are now simultaneously under attack both from Iranian opposition groups based in the United States and also from the Iranian government itself. It must truly be a lonely experience for them. But there have been some other press freedom issues this year that I believe merited more coverage than they received. Take the case of Shireen Abu Akleh, for example the Al Jazeera journalist who was shot dead earlier this year, likely by the IDF in Israel. I saw individual voices raised in support of more transparency about her case, and the outcome of the investigation into her death was reported, as you can see here. But I question why it's not her case which is most often raised by Western campaigners when talking about press freedom in our region, the GCC region and the Middle East more widely. And of course, it wasn't her case which had the most coverage when President Biden visited the region earlier this year. I think there is sometimes too much relativism, relativism, I beg your pardon, at play in which press freedom issues are raised up by those with the loudest voices. 
And I'm worried about why that is. Let's look at another example. This is my former BBC colleague, Tet Tet Kai. She is a presenter, or was a presenter, for the BBC Media Action Charity in Myanmar. She was sentenced to a prison sentence earlier this year, and her term was subsequently extended just for doing her job, for working as a journalist. The Myanmar military government's record on press freedom is terrible, and it doesn't receive enough coverage. Again, I wonder why. Is it in part because newsrooms can only really focus on one or two stories, on one or two regions, at one time. So if we're going to speak out on press freedom, and we should, we should do it everywhere, all the time, without biases based on gender, race, or geographies. It is an uncomfortable conversation, but one I think we all need to have. Now, I'd like to tell you a true story about journalists and emerging tech platforms. I once worked with a very well-known BBC News anchor, and he told me he had been asked to give the keynote lecture at a prestigious annual television festival. I asked him what he was going to talk about, and he said, well, I don't know yet because they're about to deliver the television. I said, what, what do you mean they're about to deliver the television? He said, well, I don't actually own a television, and I never watch anything. So sure enough, a month later, he gives the lecture based entirely on watching only one month's television coverage. I think, to be honest, he just wanted a free TV. But I feel the same about TikTok. For a number of years, I have been told by journalists, particularly younger journalists in our newsroom, that the future of our industry is on TikTok and on platforms like it. And I want to talk a bit today about to what extent that is true. So, over the summer, I undertook a bit of an experiment, and I joined TikTok for the first time. Now, I know, I should have been there sooner, but what better opportunity? And selflessly, on your behalf, I have thrown myself into the experiment. So there is good news. I have acquired a variety of new skills, from the TikTok woodcutting guy, the TikTok chefs, and the TikTok vets, and in our region, the TikTok property brokers. So, if you'd like to buy a two-bedroom apartment in Dubai, or if you have a lame cow, please see me after the presentation. But before I talk about its impact on journalism, though, I must say a couple of things about TikTok. At its best, it really is a multi-layered environment full of double meanings and ironic interpretations. And the way people mash up bits of movie lines, songs and dances with their own original video really is incredibly clever. At its best, it allows you to see little snippets of culture in a new setting, and it also raises up creators mainly on the virtue of their merits rather than through paid distribution or corporate ad campaigns. The other thing to say is it's highly addictive. If you found Instagram hard to put down, I'm here to tell you TikTok is the crack cocaine of social media platforms. Videos are usually short and incredibly Moorish, and it's perfectly designed for the interstitial moments in the day, sitting in a cab, riding the lift, waiting for a call to answer. You get the picture. But for journalism, how does this platform really shape up for news providers? I think the first thing to say, it's incredibly clear that almost everybody who's on TikTok is not there to consume news. So it's already very difficult to put news content into a format that audiences will welcome and follow. Let's just have a look at a few different examples here of the kind of way people tell news on TikTok. So this one is just like a really straightforward, it's not even an animated video, it's just text uh, over a picture. And again, I got pushed quite a lot of this in my feed. Okay, let's have another look at another one. So this is uh, Adam Parsons, uh, Sky News correspondent, Sky News Europe correspondent. But I think he's here today, actually, doing the uh, refugee uh, disaster. 
Um, so this is just like a straightforward video explainer that Adam made about, uh, I think, about the, the Italian elections, the far right in the Italian elections. So just like a really straightforward, like 25 second little video explainer. The next one comes with a language warning. So I deleted some of the language, but I forgot some bits at the bottom. So if you're easily offended, please don't read the hashtags at the bottom. So I thought this was interesting because it looks like a piece of news but actually it's just highly aggressive political commentary about our new prime minister. And I included it because it's difficult sometimes to um, tell the difference really on TikTok between what is news and uh, what is simply uh, comment, commentary if you like. And here's one of my favorites. So this is the LA Times. I think some of you are probably familiar with this. The LA Times have really, really gone for it and they're TikTok news feed is hosted by like an animated puppet. Um, you just have to like, you'll just have to experience it. I can't really do it justice in a, a, without showing you some video, but it's really, re it's really, really very interesting. So have a look at a few of those if you like. Let's not forget the TikTok algorithm takes no account of quality in news publishing. It's as likely to raise an anti-vax creator or content from a violent misogynist up above your trusted news brand, and there's nothing we can do about it. So, should news publishers even be there at all? I was really struck by these comments from the Axel Springer boss, Matthias Döpfner, and I thought this was a really interesting and thought-provoking contribution to the debate. Axel Springer are saying very clearly that they are never going on TikTok because the ownership is too closely tied to the Chinese state and because therefore the data privacy issues for publishers and users are insurmountable. This is bold and I have to say most other newsrooms have not followed suit. We're all stuck on the horns of the same dilemma which we've lived through with every tech platform that rises to prominence. With the possible exception of Twitter, most users on social platforms have not gone there primarily to find news. And in optimizing our content for other people's platforms, we are pumping up the profits of huge tech companies and actively undermining our own sustainability. And yet, this is where our future audiences are. It is indeed an impossible dilemma. At Al Arabiya, most of our expansion now is currently on social media, and we're investing in new programming on sports, automotive, and travel. And we want to be a social first newsroom in many ways. But we're doing it with our eyes open, and we know that we also need, over time, to convince our own audiences, our new audiences, to consume our content on our own platforms, our so-called owned and operated platforms, either online or for Al Arabiya on the Shahed streaming service, which is the biggest in the region. The experience of looking for news on TikTok goes to the heart of your theme of trust in newsrooms. Why don't audiences who know nothing about our brands or our values trust us, we wonder, naively? And I'm not sure, ingenious though it is, that the animated puppet uh, of the LA Times is going to show us the answer. As I always tell media students, in digital news, your product is your content. How you publish and how it appears is as important to your audiences as the actual editorial content itself. More and more, Audiences want no-click content. They don't want to search in Google and then click on links. And incidentally, this is becoming a problem for Google itself. They increasingly will only consume native video content in a social media app curated by algorithm. That's why research from Ofcom, the media regulator in the UK, found the biggest news providers for young audiences were now Instagram, closely followed by YouTube and TikTok, and that these audiences spent nearly an hour a day on TikTok alone. 
This is going to remain the single biggest challenge for digital news publishers. The way you want to publish your content, curated on your own platform, is very much not the way your future audience want to consume it. And one final note on this, increasingly, phone contracts now come with free social media data, not free news data, note. Everything about the way the digital world is set up is militating against the way we've made news for generations. From the handset, to free data, to vertical video, the algorithm, and on and on, we're only going to reach these audiences if we innovate faster than the tech product can change. So let's look a little bit more at how some of the choices we make in digital news pose challenges for our values and for our trust with audiences. So this next slide I found on the homepage of the esteemed Washington Post. It is one of the two newspapers I actually subscribe to with my own money. So the headline, and this is real, I didn't make this up, this actually happened. The headline, in case you can't read it, is Facing Trial, Bannon Vows to Go Medieval, But the Judge Says May. Now, I had to ask my children what May meant, so this is, this is how bad this headline is. This perfectly illustrates the principle of know your audience and the principle of be authentic. When media organizations start trying too hard to capture younger audiences, it is doomed to fail. It's like the well-known meme on the internet you've seen where the character is saying, how do you do, fellow kids? It's inauthentic. And indeed, I found out the other day that GIFs and memes themselves are now hopelessly out of date. They are media for boomers. That's old people like all of you and me. Too old, too passe. The most successful digital formats for younger audiences are clear, simple, and grown up. They are often short and simple explainers, summarizing the stories that the media makes more complicated than they need to be. Now, we know, too, that audiences love the immediacy and personal storytelling of digital formats, and I've included an example here of a first-person narrative from the BBC News website. And in fact, if you go on the BBC News website today, the top video story is entitled something like why I robbed a bank to get my money back. It's at the Lebanon, it's the woman in Lebanon who held up a bank with a plastic gun. There was, these are perfectly perfect examples. These formats pose real editorial challenges. The first person narrative is at the heart of digital news and all the rules say that is how you engage your audience from the off. But how do you challenge editorially in the first person format? This is a good example. A refugee is telling their own harrowing story. And this is such a topical story, even today, with the terrible migrant tragedy off the coast of Lesbos just in the last 24 hours here in Greece. It's inappropriate for news organizations to really press refugees on their own stories. They're often fleeing in fear of their lives. But all issues around refugees and mass migration require strong editorial challenge. And speaking here in Greece, of course, you saw the effects of this politically uh, in 2015 to 2020 in the Syrian refugee crisis. And if we don't challenge, test, and evaluate, audiences won't trust us. The way we select our stories also has a big role in that trust. When I started making notes for this speech months ago, I was going to use Elon Musk and Twitter as an example of a story that was getting too much coverage. And then I thought, well, it'll be old hat by October, but sure enough, it's back in the news again just in the last 24 hours. Stories about rich men, and it is usually men, tweeting things really need to come with more of a health warning. Like Hurricane Ian, which we mentioned earlier, these stories are important. The fate of Twitter is a good business story. But the sheer scale of the coverage is eclipsing many other important stories usually ones that aren't powered by people who already have a powerful voice. Young audiences can sense that. They know when the media has missed its mark. So am I allowed a couple of examples? 
We've already talked about Iran. I worried a lot over the summer that the historic and frankly terrifying climate change story in China was getting almost no coverage. And I thought that US coverage of the Uvalde school shootings completely missed the point for their own audiences by focusing on incremental law enforcement failings rather than really gripping the issues around combat weapons ownership. I could go on. Every newsroom has these arguments about coverage every day of the week. But when we get them wrong, and when we raise up the flashy and the superficial over the significant, we erode trust with our audiences who can see we've made a mistake. Now, in closing, I'd like to offer a couple of thoughts on the BBC, the wonderful BBC in its centenary year. It is 100 years old, almost exactly this October, and hopefully of wider interest to all of the public media represented here and those of you who consume public media. When you work for the BBC, and I did for 23 years, you try as hard as possible never to say anything controversial about it in public. So finally, I can have my say. Actually, I promised everyone when I left the BBC that I wouldn't become one of those annoying people who leaves the BBC and then constantly criticizes it. But I do want to encourage the BBC to reinvent its relationship with its audience in the UK, and specifically around how it's funded through the license fee. For too long, the UK's license fee has felt like its joke name, the tele-tax. It's a one-way transaction. You pay under threat of jail for non-payment, and you receive services which increasingly can be got elsewhere. There are a few things the BBC does which the market cannot. It's local news services and ad-free children's content and its international services, including the news, in 42 languages, to name but a few. This week, the BBC announced significant cuts to the BBC World Service, including ending Arabic radio services altogether. Ironically, that's narrowly great news for us in Al Arabiya. We'll be opening a new Arabic radio news service later this year, focused initially on Saudi Arabia, continuing our investment in new services for the region. But in order, to have to, in order to avoid having to make even more cuts in essential services, the BBC needs to rebuild its relationship with the audience through the way it's funded. Instead of paying a license, the UK audience need to feel that like they're investing a stake in a mutual organization in which they play a part, rather than being passive consumers. Like a building society, as we call them in the UK, people should see the license fee as membership of an organization rather than a tax. That two-way relationship could involve tickets for local and national events and shows. It could be a lottery fund. It could be a bond of some kind. It could give voting and governance rights for the audience who participate. But it has to feel like a mutual two-way relationship. Given the cost of living crisis in the UK, Further real-term significant rises in the basic license fee are untenable, even for those who love the BBC, and the BBC needs to stop arguing for them. Instead, the BBC should consider a two-tier license. The cost of the basic compulsory fee should fall significantly to around £100 a year. That would give access to unencrypted free-to-air services, including network radio, some TV services, the BBC website, and a basic watch-again version of iPlayer, the BBC's on-demand video player. And then there should be a voluntary membership where people pay a much higher fee for enhanced services, including a fully loaded iPlayer service, access to the BBC's wonderful deep archive, and a signed-in digital membership on the BBC website. This incentivizes the BBC to encourage its audience to feel more like they're part of an organization and it allows people who want to pay more for the BBC voluntarily, like my mum and dad, to do so. In a world where public broadcasters are facing even greater challenges, and that's nowhere more true than here in Greece, we have to be more agile about how public services broadcasters are funded. And I really hope you have your own questions and suggestions for me on this subject when I wind up. So let's just summarize a bit about what we know today. TikTok is coming for us all. It's extremely unsuitable for news services. You, as newsrooms, are completely unable to control what other people see on it. 
Most of your future audience are there. It's owned by the Chinese government. And unless you really know what you're doing, it's a completely chaotic place that is very, very hard to understand. But if I can venture onto it, so can you. I really, really hope you have a chance to experiment, not just with TikTok, but all emerging social media platforms, because they really are the future of where our news audiences is going to be. And of course, tomorrow I'll be posting a seven second version of this address, complete with dance moves. I was gonna do, I was gonna try and do the, um, I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, the thing the footballers do, but I won't, I won't embarrass my children by doing it. I'll be posting a version along with my dance moves on TikTok tomorrow. So please join me there. Thanks so much for your attention and I look forward to talking to the questions. Thank you. Great, well, I've, I've left a few minutes for questions and I really want to know what's on people's minds after such a fascinating day at the conference. So please, someone help me out and be the first person to ask a question. Please don't be shy. Yes, the lady over there. Thank you very much, so kind. Um, I wonder as um, events around the world increasingly impact young people, I'm from the United States and the Dobbs overruling by the Supreme Court abolishing abortion has galvanized young women. And I wonder as information increasingly or changes in regulations and in laws increasingly impact young people, whether they will go to um, more trusted news sites because the information they're getting on the social media platforms are so minimal, to your point, and most of the time it's not in-depth coverage and often it's misinformation. So I wonder as they get older and events like climate change begin to impact them personally, whether they'll, they'll migrate to trusted news sources. Thank you. I, I really hope so, and, and I, I like your, your optimism. Um, I'm a bit worried, actually, about that exact point, which is that we know, you know, I talked about those Ofcom figures about TikTok use, and when you're on those platforms, you have no sense of what trusted news organizations look like, and if you don't interact with them in any way, or you live in households where other people aren't interacting with them in any way, I worry that that chain where we understood for generations that slowly older audiences would come to trusted news services. I wonder whether that mechanism is becoming broken. Uh, and I think that's what really scares news organizations all over the world, is this idea that maybe for this generation they won't come to us because they just have no concept of what trusted news is and what it takes to make it, that everyone in this room has a sense of that. So, but it's really interesting what you say about issues that have really motivated people in the US, maybe around Roe v. Wade or around climate change, of course, around Black Lives Matter in recent years. You sense that there is a, a, a constituency of really highly engaged news consumers amongst very young audiences. But I'm more worried about the 80% that we can't see. We can't see them, we don't know what they're looking at, and when I go on TikTok and look at what they're looking at, it scares the hell out of me. Thank you, great question. Who's got another question? Yeah, there's a lady here in the front row. Yeah, there's a microphone coming to you just right now. Okay. So, um, I see as a journalist also the same concern about TikTok and all the social media and this rope pulling game that we are playing all the time, we in the newsrooms and the social media. I also don't see where it's going. But the question here, what we as journalists and newsrooms are doing to innovate new ways and new platforms to compete with this uh, cocaine crack uh, TikTok. And on the other side, why we are giving up all our powers actually and all our money and so many resources just trying to follow up uh, on the algorithms and they are changing the algorithms every day and we wake up every day trying just to 
follow up on what's happening and not initiating something new? It's, a, it's absolutely right. It's a very good question. And I think all of us are worried about the same thing, right? That you, uh, algorithms have no human input. And as journalists, part of our education as journalists is about our ability to cu curate and order the news. We like ordering it in sets of priorities, like a running order for a bulletin. And everything about digital news, when it's disaggregated and appears on third-party platforms, the whole idea of a running order, any journalist over 40 is just addicted to the idea of running orders. It just doesn't exist. You know, they're very likely to, unlikely to come to your website, and if they see your stuff on a third-party website, there is no running order. It's, it's coming in between a video about a dog and a video about a Lamborghini, and that's the running order, right? And, that, and I think that's what's really, really scary. We've got, well, I'm allowed one more. Nikos, can I have one more? Okay, the lady Hi. down the front, because she's got the microphone. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. The brilliant presentation. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And I really um, appreciated you starting with Iran as well, because I felt it was missing today or yesterday. Anyway, uh, I wanted to ask you why TikTok and not YouTube, for example, because there are some amazing and incredible pieces of journalism on YouTube as well, which are done either by newsrooms or just independent journalists who make some fantastic content. Yeah, so that's a really good point. I wouldn't want to give YouTube a free pass, but having said that, I think the rise of long-form journalism on YouTube, so I think like people slapping up documentaries on YouTube and them getting a huge audience amongst young people is a really unequivocally good thing. And I think one of the interesting things about the world that we now live in is that long form, so podcasting and sort of long YouTube docs are doing really well with some young audiences and very short things are doing very well with young audiences. So things that are like seven seconds long. It's the middle that's fallen out of the market. No one's going to read your 500 word web report anymore. So it's been pushed to the two, two extremes. But you're really, it's really good to give a shout out for quality content on YouTube because it's an incredibly powerful platform that the BBC and Al Arabiya and others use to distribute their content. I should just mention on Iran, perhaps in closing, I think you've got, in, in Christiane Amapur, you've probably got one of the best people coming to this conference you could have to talk about this story. And I really hope, I'm sure she'll echo some of the things I've said. Um, about you know the U.S. media the need to lead on this story, uh, and wh what how Iranian women in particular see see this story around the world. So make sure you're still here for Saturday afternoon. Good. Um, I've got I've got to wrap up. I can have one more. I'm going to have one more. Excellent. Okay. I, I was wondering if you think that the content that is put on TikTok, published on TikTok, is it journalism or is it entertainment? And should media uh, uh, companies spend money on this on this kind of content, or should they spend more money on actual journalism? Yeah, it's such a good question. I think that's why I was so struck by the LA Times' animated puppet, because it's like, this is really far off the ranch for the LA Times, right? The LA Times is a big, serious paper, but they've ended up with a TikTok account with a glove puppet, and, okay, probably doesn't cost very much, right? But you're making exactly the right point, which is, at some point, you go so far away from what it is that you became a journalist to do, which is provide trusted, free and fair information about the world, that you just think, I've gone down this rabbit hole of chasing people who aren't interested in this stuff anyway on a platform that has no salience. You know? and, and that's why, it's part of the reason I'm really interested in TikTok. And I was quite interested in Snap for the same reason, because I think Snap and TikTok are both the sort of ultimate platforms where people go who just don't, they're just not interested in news. So it's the hardest audience in a way. And how far do you go to like gamify your newsroom content? And at or at one point, like Axel Springer, do you say, do you know what, I'm just not gonna play. I'm gonna put my great content on my own platform. If you want it, you come pay for it. And, uh, and, and the, you people need to accept the consequences of that. Say again, too. Yeah. I wanted just to say maybe they changed their mind because now they are doing cooperation with Snapchat. <laughs> okay, there we go. There's a great flexible German mentality right there. <laughs> um, brilliant. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you this evening. Thank you um, for all your support. And 
Uh, Nikos and the team, thanks for a brilliant uh, couple of days of, um, uh, of, of presentations. I'm really looking forward to the next panel as well. So thanks for being so nice to me. See you all soon. Thank you. <laughs>